Well, how's everybody doing tonight? Y'all ready to go? Yeah. All right. Well, one of the things you uh, may or may not realize about me, and if you uh, don't know me, obviously you're not going to realize this unless you've got ESPN or something like that. But one of the things that we love to do in my family is watch musical theater. Now, from the way I talk and the way I dress, the way I act, probably the first thing in your mind of things I enjoy doing, watching Oklahoma is probably not high on the list of things you thought. But I grew up in a musical family. And the family I grew up in was a family uh, that was all instrumental. My mom and dad played in a band back in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, they uh, would go from bar to bar in West Virginia, Eastern Ohio, Western Virginia, uh, Northeastern Kentucky, and play all the standards of the day. Uh, in fact, I have a photo at my house of my dad with his hair about down here to his hip, and he is bending over backwards like this with his Stratocaster, nailing a uh, whole lot of love by Led Zeppelin. Now, if you met my dad today and saw that picture, you would think I was lying to you. But music was a huge part of our family. And you know the good news about that is that I received 0% of any of the talent that my parents had when it came to musical things. My sister was drum major in high school. She uh, was a piano major in college. My other sister uh, played in the marching band in college, but that was not my thing. But I enjoy watching people sing and dance and uh, do all that fun stuff. And the reason why that all matters tonight is because the passage we're going to be looking at is the Song of Solomon. And it is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 14, that we are going to focus. Now, uh, why do I mention musical theater in the midst of talking about Song of Solomon? Well, if you look at the book of the Songs of Solomon, or Song of Songs, whatever you might want to call it, it is the third of a three-act play. Now, you may never thought of it that way, but that's what I like to think of when I look at the book of Proverbs, book of Ecclesiastes, and the book of Song of Songs. You have an opening act where all the principal players are kind of introduced. You learn about who Solomon is, what Solomon desires for his son, what Solomon desires for his people. And then, as like all good plays, you have the second act, which is full of all of the dark stuff. With all of the difficulties, with all of the trials, all of the uh, defeats that the main character faces one of the things you need to have a good play, a good movie, a good story, is you need something called a character arc. You need to see somebody move from point A to point B and see that they earned that blessing. And so you go from Proverbs to Ecclesiastes to the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs is a love story. It's a story of triumph. It's a story of thanksgiving. It's a story of hope. It's a story of beauty. It's a story of love. And yes, it's a story of delighting in a husband and a wife. But it's not just any husband and wife that's in, uh, in view here in the book of Song of Songs. Now, if you look down at uh, chapter 2 of the Song of Songs with me real quick, one of the things you're going to notice is in your Bible, as in my Bible, I assume that there are directions as to who is talking at what point. And if you look down there, you'll see at the beginning of chapter 2 uh, that, uh, the, uh, that the beloved is speaking. And he says to himself, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. And then you have somebody called the Shulamite speaking. Now, if you go back to the first chapter of the book of Song of Solomon, you see that the beloved and the Shulamite are lovers. They delight in one another. 
And what's important for us tonight as our subject, the last two talks, has been the Lord Jesus Christ, is that this book, the Song of Songs, is about who? Let's try that again. Who's this book, who's this book about? Jesus. It's book about Jesus, right? Because what's every book in the Bible about? Jesus. Jesus, right? And so the beloved, we are to understand, is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is speaking to somebody. Now, in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians, when we hear about the love that a husband is to have for his wife, does anybody remember what the illustration is that Paul uses? Right? Christ's love for the church. Right? A husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. And when we hear that words and we apply them to the Song of Solomon, which is about Jesus and his bride, right, the Shulamite is the church. And so when the beloved is speaking, Jesus is speaking. When the Shulamite is speaking, it is the church responding uh, to the entreaties of her husband, of the one that she loves, the one that she desires. And so when we talk about Jesus Christ and our relationship to Him, we not only rest in Him, as we heard last night, but it's very important that we delight in Jesus Christ. And one of the things about a true love that exists between a husband and a wife is that a husband loves his wife not because of what she can do for him, but purely for the fact that she is his wife. Not because of the benefits, but because of who she is as a person. Right? That's what true love is. It doesn't ask the question, what do I get out of this relationship? Right? It's not seeking you know, the, 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 the future things. It's seeking the reality of the, the person that's before them. And so as we look at the details that the Shulamite and the Beloved of, when you speak of one another in this passage, I want you to keep that in your mind. Is this how you speak of Jesus? Is this how the church of the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of Jesus? So turn with me there again to verse 1. We're going to read through verse 12 of Psalm of Solomon, chapter 2, verse, uh, you know, beginning there, verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. Like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes. Give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you've given us these holy words of Scripture, these perfect words that you have provided for us in your grace, dear God, may you send your Holy Spirit into this place. May we know the power 
of this love that we hear uh, from Jesus Christ and this love that the Shulamite shows unto her beloved. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, you know, as you read through this, again, the, the language is, is boisterous. The language is it, 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 it's dripping with love. It's dripping with this, this sweetness that, that almost is outside of mere human words. They almost are not enough to contain the love that the Shulamite and uh, the Lord Jesus have for one another. And, and you hear this again at the beginning because notice the language that is used. I am. For those of y'all who uh, uh, you know, know the name of God that uh, Jehovah gives to Moses in uh, the burning bush, what does he say is his name? I am who I am. This is a statement again of not just the fact that he happens to be the husband of the, the Shulamite, the beloved of the Shulamite, but that he is the Almighty One. I am the rose of Sharon in the lily of the valleys. You know, if you, you think of that language again, uh, what is it about a rose? You know, it's interesting that you know, the rose is, has almost a universal symbol. And if somebody hands you a rose, what does that mean? They love you. Some of you uh, happen to watch a television show that I catch glimpses of against my will uh, before football games. But what is the great symbol of that television show? The rose. And it goes back thousands and thousands of years. The rose has always been a key symbol of love. And Jesus here is describing himself as the rose of Sharon. Now, those of y'all who live in South Carolina probably read this a little bit differently, right? We, you know, how should this be read? Sharon, right? The Rose of Sharon. Well, the testimony we see here again is that Sharon was known in the Mediterranean as the place to get roses. It was the, the kind of the, the, the greatest rose factory, if you will. And so Jesus here is describing himself as the very factory of love. That he is the source of love. And when we think of the language of love in relationship to Jesus Christ, you know, what does Jesus say is the greatest love? Laying down your life for your friend. You know, the, the language that we read here in Psalm 22 is filled with gospel testimony. You know, we hear that as the Shulamite is speaking to the daughter of Jerusalem, it, it, and I'll explain who the daughters are here in a second, he, he, she speaks to the fact uh, that he has done what? What? The voice of the beloved is what? He has called out unto her. He, he has spoken unto her and called her uh, to rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And what does verse 11 say? For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. Well, for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the seminal event in our relationship with Christ? Well, it is the fact that winter is gone. Right? That the rains have passed. That the judgment has gone away. That the darkness has been obliterated by the light of the Savior. That through His death, through His resurrection, we have been brought out of darkness, out of the depths of winter, out of the, 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 the nastiness of all of these things, and we've been brought into the peace and the comfort of His presence. This is, this is beautiful gospel language that explains to us why the Shulamite loves the beloved. Because what has he presented unto her? He's presented unto her himself. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. 
Now, if you think back to Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is describing uh, for the disciples and those gathered why they are to seek Him, why they're to be at rest in Him. You remember, He, he says there that what is greater array than all of Solomon's beauties? He says the lilies of the valley, lily of the field. And you know, Jesus doesn't use words on accident. Right? He doesn't use words just by happenstance because they sound good. This is the kind of thing that Jesus is speaking of then. Again, the, the benefits we receive are wonderful, but we don't receive the benefits if we don't first receive Jesus himself. And so the Shulamite, again, says there in verse 3, like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Now there's all kinds of rumors and innuendos and thoughts about what the fruit was that Adam ate in the garden that caused all of us to fall into sin at the breaking of the covenant of work. And traditionally, what fruit has often been used? The apple, right? Well, again, this is just me surmising to take it for what it's worth. But I think there is a picture being drawn here. Because remember, the first time the fruit of the tree was eaten, what did it bring? Right? Death. Here we see the fruit of the tree bringing what? Life. And we see the fruit of the tree not just bringing light, but bringing delight unto the heart of the Shulamite. Right, and so again, our, our relationship with Jesus Christ, the, the gift of salvation that we have received, right, it doesn't just take care of an accounting problem that we have. Right? We have too many sins, and so we need the righteousness of Christ to pay for all these things. You know, often, especially in Reformed theology, we have a serious problem with only focusing on what you know the, you know, the big fancy people call forensic justification. Right? The idea that all that matters in your Christian life is that your sins are paid for. Now, is that important? Yes, right? That's very important, but that's not, again, the focus of the gospel. And the focus of the gospel is that we who were aliens, we who were enemies, we who were in rebellion against Jesus Christ, what have we now become? Now friends, we are now sons and daughters of the living God. We are now members of the covenant family. We were once of our father the devil, and now we are of our father who art in heaven. Right, and that's, that, that's a you notice again in the language of the Shulamite, this is what she is proclaiming to the daughters of Jerusalem. You know, I said a minute ago that I'd explain who those people are. Well, you know, generally speaking, the daughters of Jerusalem are everybody who is not Jesus or the Shulamite woman. The, the language here is, is kind of picturesque of all of the children of Jerusalem. Now, in the Old Covenant, when we think of the daughters of Jerusalem, we think of the sons and daughters of, of, uh, of Jacob. And we think of the twelve tribes of Israel. We think of those who are members of the Old Covenant. But again, we live on this side of the cross. So which covenant do we live under? The New Covenant, right? So we hear this language, we understand that yes, in the Old Covenant, it likely was meant for the Jews for those whom Christ first came to speak, right? He says to the Jews first and then to the Greeks. But now we read this in the light of the New Testament. And so this is a word from the Shulamite to all the human race. To everybody who is in existence. And the good news, of course, is what is everybody? Right? There's two things that everybody shares. First of all, everybody is a what? A sinner. Second of all, Every human being on the earth is made in the image of God. And one of the things us good old ARPs believe in is the free offer of the gospel. 
I'm sure you've heard people come up to you and, and you know, kind of push John 3.16 on you and say, look, it says, whosoever believes. So all that Calvinism stuff must be junk, right? Well, we turn it on its head and say, yes, that's what it says. Whosoever believes gets what? Eternal life. That's what the Bible teaches. And so, who should we proclaim the gospel to? Everybody. All the daughters of Jerusalem. And what do we tell them about the gospel? Notice what the Shulamite says in verse 4. He brought me where? To the banqueting house. Is that not a, a, a picture that we see over and over again in the gospels that Jesus describes? Again, the, the kingdom... We, you know, one of the, the parables that Jesus uses, right, is the parable of the wedding feast. Right? And, and the people who come in, uh, they receive the bounty of the house. They receive the bounty of all of the blessings that come from the wedding. From the, 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 the consummation of the love between husband and wife. And it's not accidental that the first miracle that we see of Jesus in the Gospel of John is where? A wedding. How often do we use that phrase, the wedding supper of the Lamb? Again, Song of Solomon is pointing us here to that picture. As, as, as Solomon says, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was what? Love. Again, it's not wrong for us to focus on the love of God for us. And sometimes we associate love with all the wrong things. And we hear that we are to be uh, you know, people who show love to one another. And that should be true. You should show love to everyone. But you should show forth the love. Because what has Christ shown forth to you? Love. He loved you so much that what did He do? He laid down His life for you so that you might no longer be outside the house. That you might be members of it. You might be children of the living God. That you might be the bride of His Son. He brought me to the banqueting house and His banner over me was love. He sustained me with a case of raisins. Refreshed me with apples for I am lovesick. You know, I mentioned before that I like music theater and I like plays and all these things. Think of that word, love sick. You know, how often does that picture show up uh, in plays and musical theater and the like? What do people do when they're love sick? All kinds of dumb things, right? <laughs> and why do they do dumb things? Because what are they not doing? They're not thinking, right? Because what's the only thing on their mind? Their beloved. Everything gets pushed to the side. Everything gets forgotten about. Now, how many times have you seen a romantic comedy and you know that gets to that point where the you know, protagonist has just decided that he or she can't live with the other person and they quit their job, right? And they, they just run out of their business or they run out of their house, wherever they are, and they just get in the car and they drive for hours just so that they can be in the presence of their beloved. Well, that's what the Shulamite was describing here of her love for Jesus Christ. That everything is abandoned. Just so that she can be in the presence of the banqueting house of her, uh, of her beloved. You know, notice again how she describes the way he cares for her. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. Again, sometimes you know, we don't like using this book in youth stuff because of the images it brings forth. And there's some danger there, for certain. I don't want to downplay that. But we can't be afraid of the Bible. I can't be afraid of what the Bible says. Because love is a beautiful thing. Christian marriage is a wonderful gift. Yes, all marriage is wrapped with sin because we're sinners, but... Just because sin exists doesn't mean we should not seek the holy and the good. 
And so we see this image here of uh, the left hand under uh, my head and this right hand embraces me. Now, the, the picture here is that she is laying in his bosom. I mean, she's laying in the comfort of his embrace. Again, you, you hear that language, and, and at least my mind is drawn towards John chapter 10. Remember that one of the promises that Jesus gives as the great shepherd to the disciples of John 10 is that they have no reason to be afraid of the evil one, or anyone for that matter, because where are they? They're held in the arms of the beloved. And they're held in the arms of Jesus Christ. And where is Jesus held? But in the bosom of the Father. And nothing can separate. Whenever we go through difficult times, I'm sure you've heard this at funerals. What's the passage from Romans chapter 8 that gets read? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that is what the Shulamite is telling the daughters of Jerusalem. His left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughter of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. I, the, the, the Shulamite is telling the, the world or anybody who's willing to listen, don't wait. Run like the gazelles. Run like the does of the field. Do not wait for love to be stirred up in you until it pleases. For the love that you need is already here. Quit seeking it and all the other things of the world because the love that you need as a human being and as a sinner is present right here in Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the, the Shulamite is of the mind that everybody needs to hear about. Now, most of y'all are at that age where you have friends and family and close ones who are, you know, in that time where they are finding Mr. or Mrs. Wright. And it probably goes a lot more for you young ladies than you young men, because men don't talk about anything. But... <laughs> How many of you know, ladies have gotten a call at 3 o'clock in the morning? Or Well, I guess nobody calls anybody anymore. <laughs> but uh, you know, how many of y'all got, you know, uh, I don't even know what illustration to use. I'm so out of uh, thing here. What, what do y'all use to talk to each other most of the time? You know, Instagram or whatever, right? <laughs> the Facebook or Twitter or whatever, right? You, you know, but you, you breathlessly just... Just message your best friend because of this conversation that you've just had with your beloved. And you are lovesick and you can't wait to tell everybody about this man or this uh, this man that you met. And usually what's your reaction when you get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning with that? <laughs> this, this couldn't have waited until a, a more proper time, but that's what you do when you're in love. You're not concerned about people's feelings, right? You're not concerned about what time it is. You're not concerned about circumstances. You can't wait to talk about your beloved. And that is what the Shulamite is saying. There is never a wrong time to hear about Jesus. There's never a wrong time to tell somebody about Jesus because he's your beloved. And you want everybody else to know your beloved too. See, that's the cool thing about Jesus is he's for everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek, a male or female, slave or free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's why we preach the gospel with boldness. That's why we preach it with assurance. That's why we preach it with such a, you know, you know, fervency. You know, I've never understood how men can preach about Jesus in a monotone voice. I've never understood how men can preach about Jesus as, he, as if he's just a character in a story that they're trying to explain at 11 a.m. Because what has Jesus done for me? Jesus has saved me from my sin. Jesus has washed me in his blood. Jesus has called me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Jesus has given unto me something I could never in a million lifetimes give to myself. 
which is the righteousness that he earned through his perfect life. That he gave unto me by grace. That he delivered unto me as the Shulamite here describes by the gifts that she has received. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my life, my fair one, and come away. Again, I didn't go seeking Jesus. Jesus came and sought me. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 says so beautifully. From before the foundation of the world, what happened? God happened. What did God do? God established all things in accordance with His glory. And what was His glory? That He might reconcile me unto Himself. And if that's not a reason to be joyful, if that's not a reason to delight in the love of God, then I don't know what else to say. Because that is what we proclaim. That's what we live. That's what we do day by day. We delight in Jesus Christ because He is our beloved. We are love sick for Him. My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come. You know, there's nothing that annoys a preacher more than when he's standing up in front of everybody. And this is far more true of Presbyterian than anybody else for some ridiculous reason. And you look out. And you see most of the men not singing. Most of the men, they're not even holding hymnals or more, more appropriately, psalters in their hands. And most people are just kind of... I mean, is that how you talk to your <laughs> beloved? You know, kind of gravely monotone voice hoping this gets over quickly? Or do you sing with joy in your heart? Are the words of Christ dwelling within you richly? And that is what the Shulamite wants the daughter of Jerusalem to hear. That she is singing all the day long. Because she has her beloved. And he, she has his, his voice in her heart. The time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs. And the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Almost sounds like it's written by Shakespeare. Some kind of loving sonnet. It sounds like something out of Romeo and Juliet or something of that nature. I mean... You, you can't read those words without getting happy. Because that is what the Beloved has done for you. He has given unto you this delighting love that you want to share with everyone. Because He's given unto you more than just stuff. He's given to you Himself. And that is the foundation of our faith. That is the foundation of our witness. That's why we come to Appalachia. To share Jesus Christ with sinners. To be renewed in our own love for Jesus Christ. To be renewed in our own understanding of what it means to be a disciple of the one who has died for us. And we'll close with verse 14 here. Oh my dove in the clefts of the rock and the secret place of the cliff. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Remember... The, the, the time that Moses pleaded with God that he might see him. Remember, what, what did God do? He put him in the cleft of the rock. And it, the Bible tells us that Moses could barely handle the hindquarters of God. It was overwhelming for him. So much so when he came off the mountain, what did he look like? He was glowing. Well, tell me you've never seen somebody glow after they've been in the presence of their beloved. What, how, how do we describe young ladies on their wedding day? They're glowing. They are, they, they are radiant. I've never heard anybody describe a groom that way. 
But that's how we are arrayed for our Savior on the, in the picture that's given to us in Revelation. As, we just, as the church, as the bride of Christ descends from heaven, how is she pictured? But beautiful. Arrayed in all the glory. Because whose glory does she reflect? But that of her Savior. He was given unto her Himself. He has laid down His life for her. That she might be His forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the witness of Your truth, for the goodness of Your testimony, and for the way that You give unto us. Again, this picture of the love that we're to have for our Savior. That we might delight in Him and be at rest in His promises. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs>